Hello again everyone. Welcome to our session here about game-based learning. And this is our last, uh, last pedagogy to consider in this course uh, and uh, for your final project. Remember these, uh, these ideas, these pedagogies will be considered later on in the program when you get to the final, uh, final project uh, and leading up to that in designing that final project you could uh, use the you, you will be using one of these pedagogies to actually test with students uh, some content that you'll develop a lesson you'll develop um, and come back and report on that with some with some uh, action-based research that you will be doing games uh, these days games tend to be uh, popularized in the in, in the video in the video realm where students are playing games or kids are playing games or even adults playing games. But let's uh, take a look at some basics of this and you have an opportunity to explore some games. In the uh, reading there is a rather long lengthy list of games for you to explore uh, for, uh, for a discussion board. Meanwhile, con consider the, the properties uh, of games, in particular from the, the, Cop the Klopfer article uh, there, there are some basics of properties of games that we should consider. So uh, gaming and education, uh, and even gaming for entertainment, they, they have these uh, kind of basic principles. And that mean, means that there are rules, goals and objectives, outcomes, and feedback. So very similar to um, what we want students to learn. We have, we have rules, we have goals, objectives, we, have, we provide feedback. So gaming, uh, in its core, is very similar to having what we want students to learn. So there's certain properties uh, in games, whether these games happen to be electronic, digital, or they happen to be classroom-based or, or board-based. And usually in games, there, uh, there's an opponent. Uh, there's conflict. Sometimes even the opponent uh, can be... Um, the, the system itself, the rules, the game itself. Uh, for example, in Monopoly, where you pick up cards and you have to uh, perform certain actions. So there, there's conflict there of, of uh, in that game of movement on the board uh, or jeopardizing some of your assets um, in some fashion in those games. So we, we have we have this idea of opposition. We have conflict. Uh, we have challenge. Uh, we have competition, whether it's with the system or we're competing against other players. Usually we want to do this with more than one player. And more importantly, it, it has a story. And I want you to reflect on what you do in your classroom with games. Perhaps you use games for review processes, uh, whether it's a, a math game where students go to the board and uh, do math, uh, trying to see who can do it faster than the other, or you have a Jeopardy-like game uh, for for a review, uh, th think about typically those games typically don't have a story attached to them. Uh, and if we could attach a story to them, that would they would make them powerful in this game in this game round. But normally there is a story associated uh, with this conquering a mountain, conquering a kingdom, rescuing someone in, in the most popular types of digital games. So the the gaming has a story to go along with it. Think, think about the basic board games you played as a child. They had a story that went along with them or an idea that went along with them. So we have these basic premises of these games of rules and objectives and feedback and conflict and opposition and, and competition. And we have a story that goes along with that. And then we have interaction. We have interaction where we are interacting with each other. We're interacting with the, the game environment. So there's interaction. And this is very similar to this notion of interaction in education. This, this term interaction, it's, it's been written about in many places. Uh, there's a rather short article in your, uh, in, in your reading for this module in regards to interaction. Here is the way that I perceive of, of interaction from those articles and the way that I the way that I see it. Oh, 
uh, first, let's let's do this. There's uh, uh, the proliferation of game consoles. Uh, this was an interesting note as I was doing some reading for for this module, and that the number of game consoles that have been digital game consoles that have been sold. And uh, it was reported just in June of 2014 that uh, Sony now has the lead in game console sales. Uh, and for one year, that ended uh, March of 2014, Sony sold nearly 19 million game consoles. And Nintendo was just above 16 million game consoles. So this idea of gaming is out there. It's out there considerably. And uh, it's mainly digital, but there are other ways to game besides digital. It's, of course, very popular. It's very graphic-oriented. Um, and it meets those requirements of what the games meet requirements of what the gaming idea is. How can we apply games uh, to our learning settings? Now, of course, that's going to be pretty challenging with respect to uh, teaching some concepts. It, it might be really difficult to develop or find a game to show uh, students to do Algebra 2, whereas to perhaps uh, teach US history, we can possibly find games. To, to teach stock market, we can find lots of games. Uh, to teach other concepts, we may have to dig deeply. And other concepts, we might find lots of game-like game, game game-like appeal. Also, too likely as you're younger, there are uh, a wider spread of games. And as the students get older, they tend to go to these digital type of games. So it depends upon the age group and the, and the topic. And you have that, you have that reference. Uh, so some questions here for you, uh, for you to respond to. In the Klopfer, in, in the Klopfer article, there are some teacher scenarios. And uh, which one of these scenarios seems feasible in your setting? And what do you see as possibilities of games in your setting that meet the criteria of games? What games can you use in your setting is the second question. Going to this interaction idea, Th this is the way that I visualize this idea of interaction. I refer to it as an interaction triangle, where there are three pieces, three corners of that triangle. One of those corners, obviously, the content. The second corner is uh, the student or the student group, multiple students. And then we have the third corner being the instructor, the teacher. So obviously, what we want to do here is to have our students interact with the content. We want them to learn the content. So the line that goes from the student to the content, we get the student there through essential understandings, uh, course goals, and insights that students develop. In this constructivist environment, they bring in other experiences. They bring in other learning. And in that, in that environment, we, uh, they, they have insights that they bring into us. So we have, we have student to content interaction through these essential understandings, course goals, uh, other means that you have in your setting to describe learning activities, learning standards, uh, and, and similar. And then the students framework that they come into our class, our courses with, our classrooms. We then have the interaction between students. Really occurs on one of the corners of the triangle. We want student to student interaction. And we, in, in this setting, we do our best to do that with opportunities for discussion boards and uh, other ways that you share what you are thinking and what you are doing. And, and as you go through our program, you will, you will see that there are opportunities to share drafts of your work, to share your ideas through discussion boards, um, and other means. 
And then we have the red line. The red line is the one that, that has most people concerned, especially in a setting that's pretty non-traditional like we are working in here. And that is the teacher to student interaction, which I've made a red, a double red arrow, along then with the teacher to content, the teacher's mastery, the instructor's mastery of that content to be able to work with the students. The, this red line, again, is, is one that, in particular, many of your school districts are concerned about in courses like this uh, because they are concerned that there may not be enough teacher-to-student interaction, much like one would get in a correspondence course, a traditional correspondence course where you had a workbook and uh, some other activities you did. You put it in the mail, mail it in. Um, sometime later, you get a, you get a score back. Uh, that's a correspondence. You, you don't have much interaction with the teacher. The, the teacher does a lot for us. Our, our teachers do a lot for us in the sense of think about what you do in the classroom. You provide explanation. You provide context. You provide uh, a, a variety of very difficult things that you've that you've developed over time of how you interact with students, how you get them to work how you work with them, how you provide them feedback. This is all very essential. And so as you think about gaming, the interaction that occurs, we could say that the student uh, or the players, there, uh, there is content of this game. Um, the teacher could come in there as the rules, as the feedback. Nice job that you're doing, you get in, uh, uh, in, uh, in games. Uh, you get feedback in that fashion. So this interaction triangle uh, in, in our learning is very, very essential. And getting that student to teacher feedback in educational settings is one that is significant because that's why we're here. We're here to provide explanation and context and perspectives and stories to our, to our students. That's what we do. And that's, that's what we're about. That's why we are there with children, or in my case, I'm here with you um, to, to work with you uh, through, through these ideas. So this red line is very, very significant. And in some non-traditional digital settings, this is what um, administrators have really concerns about where teachers are taking courses in non-traditional settings, online, blended settings, hybrid settings, so, so that there is lots and lots of teacher to student interaction and student-to-student -student interaction. Those are their requirements. To go along with this, I have a couple of questions for you to consider in this. Um, and it has come right, comes right back to the setting that you're learning in. And um, seeing these three corners of my interaction triangle, as I call it, it's, although it's certainly not, the idea is not mine, that's what I name it. And so with these interactions, um, in your setting, which, from your setting, so you, my, the students here in this course are working with a variety of different age groups, and your answers are going to vary because of that, because of the interactions that you have and you need in your setting. Which ones would be very difficult to replicate in our setting or um, student settings such as a group of fifth graders taking being in a hybrid setting or being in an online setting. We've talked about these online schools. So which types of these interactions do you think if you were teaching your students in an online or hybrid setting would be very, very difficult to replicate? My other question for uh, game-based is, again, back here, this last question is about interaction. And so if, if you were uh, assuming the role of a technology specialist in, in a school or a district and you were creating professional development, part of what we recently talked about the last time we met was supporting the PLC, the professional learning community. And as a technology specialist, you would be sitting outside that group but supporting them, not necessarily knowing all the details of what they were doing but know enough to know what support they would need, whether it was with hardware and software uh, processes, or whether you needed to provide direct, direct instruction to them. Maybe there is a technology being introduced, and you need to provide direct instruction to them. 
So if you were designing a professional development course uh, for that group, for whatever scenario happened to be, but supporting a group, a group of teachers at a level, a group of, of um, in, in a PLC, how, how would you assure that there's interaction between students, the teachers? Um, and how would you ensure that there was interaction between you and the instructor? So you have the choice here of whether this is a completely face-to-face -face setting or it is, um, it is something non-traditional, whether it's uh, fully online or hybrid. So you, you can make the assumption here of how to answer this question. But even in a professional development setting, how do we ensure that, that the teachers are, our students, that those teachers are just not interacting with content, but rather in a professional development setting, they are having opportunities to interact with each other and, and opportunities to interact with you.